Welcome to History Uncovered, where we delve into the stories and events that have shaped our world. If you're a fan of history, be sure to hit that subscribe button below. We release new videos every day so you'll always have something new to discover. By subscribing, you'll be the first to know when our latest episodes are released, and you'll be supporting us in our mission to bring fascinating stories from the past to a wider audience. In this episode, we journey back to the heart of the ancient Near East, to the towering ziggurats and bustling streets of the Assyrian Empire. We will be exploring the life and reign of one of its most pivotal rulers, a figure whose deeds and decisions reverberated through the corridors of time, Isar Haddon. Isar Haddon, a name etched in cuneiform tablets and whispered in the annals of scholars, a king who faced insurmountable odds from revolts within his own borders to challenges from formidable foreign powers. His reign, marked by diplomatic maneuvers, vast construction projects, and the intricate dance of courtly politics, has carved a distinct niche in the vast tapestry of history. From the majestic walls of Nineveh to the rebuilt splendors of Babylon, we will trace the footsteps of this determined monarch, sifting through ancient records and archaeological findings to unveil the man behind the royal diadem. Dive deep with us as we embark on this captivating journey into the life of Isar Haddon, the Assyrian sovereign, a man who envisioned an empire where the sun's rays would never fade. In the sprawling city of Nineveh, within the mighty Assyrian empire, the corridors of power echoed with tales of ambition and betrayal. At the heart of this intrigue was Isar Haddon. Though he had been the crown prince for three years, his path to the throne was anything but straightforward. Initially, King Sennacherib had chosen his eldest son, Asernad and Sumi, appointing him as the ruler of Babylon around 700 BC, but the empire's geopolitical tensions soon took center stage. After Sennacherib's campaign against the Elamites and Chaldean rebels, the Elamites struck back, capturing Asernad and Sumi and presumably executing him. This act ignited Sennacherib's wrath, leading to a fierce retaliation against all perceived enemies. In the wake of this tragedy, Sennacherib turned to his second eldest son, Artemelisu, making him the crown prince. However, by 684 BC, in a surprising turn of events, Isar Haddon replaced Artemelisu as heir. The reasons remain unclear, but the resulting tension was undeniable. Isar Haddon later recounted in an inscription how, despite being the youngest, the gods chose him as heir, causing his brothers to rebel in jealousy. Sensing the growing animosity, Sennacherib sent Isar Haddon into exile in the western provinces for his safety. Isar Haddon, feeling betrayed, believed his brothers had poisoned their father's opinion of him. But the most shocking event was yet to unfold. In 681 BC, Artemelisu, alongside Nabusariur, assassinated Sennacherib in a temple. However, their dreams of power were short-lived. Isar Haddon, rallying an army, met his brother's forces at Hannibalbat. With soldiers defecting to his side, he marched unopposed into Nineveh. Just six weeks after the assassination, Isar Haddon was crowned in Nineveh. He immediately initiated a purge, eliminating all conspirators and potential threats. While his brothers managed to escape to Urartu, their betrayal remained a dark shadow over Isar Haddon's reign, as evident in his inscriptions detailing the events. Isar Haddon's own words capture the essence of his triumphant yet tumultuous ascent, I entered Nineveh, took my seat upon the throne, the rebels, I examined to the last man, I destroyed their seed. Isar Haddon's rise to power, marked by betrayal and intrigue, left a profound impact on his psyche. The new king, now seated on the throne of the Assyrian Empire, found himself constantly looking over his shoulder, wary of potential threats from those around him. This deep-seated mistrust extended to his servants, vassals, and even his own family. He frequently turned to oracles and priests, seeking insights into the intentions of his relatives and officials, always on the lookout for any hint of treachery. Interestingly, while his distrust was palpable towards his male relatives, the women in his life seemed exempt from such suspicions. During his reign, Isar Haddon's wife Isar Amit, his mother Nakia, and his daughter Rairat held significant influence, marking a departure from earlier Assyrian norms where women typically held limited political power. This sense of unease also influenced Isar Haddon's choice of residence. 
He opted for a palace in Nimrud, originally built as an armory by Shalmaneser III nearly two centuries prior. Instead of a central location within the city's heart, this palace was strategically situated on the outskirts, atop a separate mound, offering added protection. Between 676 and 672 BC, Isarhaddon further fortified this palace, transforming its gateways into formidable barriers, effectively isolating it from the rest of the city. A similarly secluded palace was constructed in Nineveh, reinforcing his preference for security over grandeur. While it was customary for Assyrian kings to seek guidance from the sun god Shamash, interpreting signs from the gods for political and military decisions, Isarhaddon's queries stood out. He was the only known Assyrian ruler to specifically inquire about potential betrayals. Given this behavior, many scholars have labeled Isarhaddon as paranoid. Some even speculate that he might have developed a paranoid personality disorder following his father's assassination. However, others argue against such a diagnosis, suggesting that labeling him as merely mistrustful might be more accurate. They point out that true paranoia is delusional and irrational, whereas Isarhaddon, given the circumstances of his ascent, likely had genuine adversaries plotting against him. Isarhaddon, having secured his throne amidst tumult and treachery, turned his attention to the southern part of his empire, Babylonia. This region, only recently annexed into the Assyrian Empire, held a distinct identity, having been governed by its native kings for centuries. Isarhaddon embarked on an ambitious campaign of building and restoration throughout Babylonia, surpassing the efforts of any Assyrian ruler before him. His intent was clear, to demonstrate the benefits of Assyrian rule and position himself as a benevolent ruler, akin to a native Babylonian king. Babylon, the eponymous city of the region, had been a political epicenter for over a millennium. However, in a bid to suppress Babylonian independence, Isarhaddon's father had raised the city in 689 BC, even relocating the statue of its patron deity, Bel, deep into Assyria. Recognizing the symbolic and strategic importance of Babylon, Isarhaddon announced its restoration in 680 BC, marking it as one of his paramount endeavors. Reports from his reign detail the vast scope of this project, debris removal, resettlement of displaced Babylonians, reconstruction of buildings, and the meticulous restoration of the Asajala Temple Complex and the towering ziggurat at Amenenki. Isarhaddon's approach was not just about brick and mortar. It was symbolic. While Assyrian kings were traditionally seen as warriors, Babylonian kings were revered as builders, especially of temples. Isarhaddon embraced this role, carefully distancing himself from the city's prior destruction. In his inscriptions in Babylon, he portrayed himself as divinely chosen, omitting any mention of his father's role in the city's devastation. In his own words, Isarhaddon proclaimed, Great King, Mighty Monarch, Lord of All. When in the reign of an earlier king there were ill omens, the city offended its gods and was destroyed at their command. It was me, the Sarhaddon, whom they chose to restore everything to its rightful place. The king's efforts were well received. A report from his appointed governor in Babylon reads, The Babylonians have received me kindly. From Sippar to Babmerit the chiefs of the Chaldeans blessed the king, saying, Who resettled of Babylon? While the city's full restoration extended beyond Isarhaddon's reign, evidence suggests he achieved most of his goals, particularly the near-complete restoration of Asajala and Edamananki. Beyond Babylon, Isarhaddon's touch was felt in other southern cities. He returned statues of deities, previously seized in wars, to their rightful temples. Restoration projects were initiated in cities like Uruk, Nippur, Borsippa, and Akkad. Yet, Isarhaddon was not just the Babylonian king of Assyria. His heartland remained in the north. While he undertook significant projects in Babylonia, he also focused on Assyria, restoring temples, palaces, and fortifications. In Assur, he repaired the Azara Temple, and similar projects were undertaken in Nineveh and Arbila. These efforts underscored his commitment to both regions, ensuring that neither felt neglected under his rule. In the early years of Isarhaddon's reign, the political landscape was rife with uncertainty. Vassals, sensing the instability in Assyria, harbored hopes of breaking free, speculating that the new king hadn't yet solidified his rule. 
foreign powers, always on the lookout for territorial expansion, were also on the move. However, they soon realized that, despite Isarhaddon's inherent distrust, the Assyrian machinery, its governors and soldiers, stood firmly behind their new leader. Two significant threats loomed large, the kingdom of Urartu to the north, led by King Rusa II, which provided refuge to Isarhaddon's rebellious brothers, and the Sumerians, a nomadic tribe causing unrest along Assyria's western borders. In a strategic move, Isarhaddon formed an alliance with the Scythians, renowned for their cavalry prowess, hoping to deter the Sumerians. Yet, by 676 BC, the Sumerians had advanced deep into Assyrian territory, leaving a trail of destruction. Isarhaddon, taking matters into his own hands, led his forces into battle in Cilicia, successfully driving back the invaders. He proudly proclaimed in his inscriptions that he personally slew the Sumerian king, Tuspa. Simultaneously, Sidon, a city in the Levant and a recent addition to the Assyrian vassalage, revolted. Isarhaddon responded swiftly, marching his forces along the Mediterranean coast. By 677 BC, Sidon was captured, though its king, Abdimulkuti, managed a brief escape by sea before being captured and executed the following year. This year also marked Isarhaddon's decisive victory over the Sumerians. Another defiant vassal king, Sanjuari, met a similar fate. In a display of power and warning, Isarhaddon had the heads of these two kings hung around the necks of their nobles, who were then paraded through Nineveh. Sidon's status was downgraded to an Assyrian province, and its territories were redistributed, with cities being gifted to Baal of Tyre. Isarhaddon's account of his conquest of Sidon is both vivid and assertive, Abdimulkuti, king of Sidon, who defied my rule, ignored my commands, and relied on the vastness of the sea, I captured him like a fish from the sea and beheaded him. His family, his palace's inhabitants, treasures, and vast populations were taken to Assyria. His vast populace, livestock, and countless riches were transported to my land. I displayed his head as a warning and transformed Sidon into an Assyrian province. After successfully quelling the uprisings in Sidon and Cilicia, Isarhaddon shifted his focus to the kingdom of Urartu. Initially, he targeted the Meneans, allies of Urartu. But by 673 BC, he was directly at odds with Urartu. In this conflict, Isarhaddon set his sights on the kingdom of Shepria, a vassal state of Urartu. The capital, Abumu, situated by Lake Van, became a focal point. The Shuprian king's reluctance to hand over Assyrian political refugees, possibly linked to Sennacherib's assassination, was the spark that ignited this confrontation. Although the Shuprian king eventually agreed to surrender the refugees, Isarhaddon deemed the response too slow. The Assyrians laid siege to Abumu, and after a failed attempt by the defenders to burn the Assyrian siege weapons, the city was captured, plundered, and annexed. The political refugees met a grim fate, while some Urartian criminals were handed over to the Urartian king, possibly as a gesture to mend ties. However, while Isarhaddon was embroiled in these northern conflicts, trouble brewed in the south. In 675 BC, the Elamites seized the opportunity to invade Babylonia, capturing the city of Sippar. Isarhaddon's forces, engaged in Anatolia at the time, had to abandon their campaign to defend their southern territories. The capture of Sippar, a significant setback, was conspicuously absent from Isarhaddon's records. But the Elamite threat was short-lived. Following the death of the Elamite king, Cumban Kaltash II, his successor, Ertak, eager to avoid further conflict with Assyria, withdrew from Babylonia and returned stolen statues of gods. This led to a diplomatic alliance, solidified by an exchange of royal children to be raised in each other's courts. Yet, Isarhaddon's ambitions were not limited to his immediate neighbors. In the winter of 673 BC, he set his sights on Egypt, a long-standing rival that had consistently backed Assyrian dissenters. Hoping for a swift victory, Isarhaddon led a rapid march towards Egypt. However, by the time his forces reached the Egyptian stronghold of Ashkelon, they were exhausted. Here, they faced the formidable Kushite pharaoh Taharqa and suffered what many believed to be one of Assyria's most significant defeats. This setback forced Isarhaddon to abandon his Egyptian conquest ambitions temporarily, retreating to Nineveh. 
Isar Haddon's reign was marked not only by his military and political endeavors, but also by his personal struggles. By 673 BC, following his unsuccessful invasion of Egypt, it was evident that the king's health was in decline. This posed a significant challenge, as the Assyrian monarchy demanded its ruler to be in impeccable physical and mental condition. Isar Haddon's health issues were manifold. He frequently suffered from debilitating illnesses, often confining himself to his chambers, abstaining from food, drink, and human interaction. The death of his cherished wife, Ashara Hammett, in 672 BC, coupled with the loss of their infant child, only deepened his despair. The king's emotional state was evident in the correspondence of the time, particularly in the letters of his chief exorcist, Adachimuyuzer, who was primarily responsible for the king's well-being. One poignant letter from Adachimuyuzer reads, Regarding what the king, my lord, wrote to me, I am deeply saddened. How did we act that I am so grieved for my little one? If there was a cure, you would have sacrificed half your kingdom for it. But what can be done? O king, my lord, it is beyond our control. The detailed accounts of Isar Haddon's health, as documented by his courtiers and physicians, paint a grim picture. He suffered from a myriad of symptoms, including severe vomiting, persistent fever, nosebleeds, dizziness, agonizing earaches, diarrhea, and depression. His physical appearance was marred by a chronic skin rash that covered most of his body, including his face. Despite having access to the best medical minds of Assyria, the king's condition remained a mystery. The physicians, in their desperation, admitted their inability to diagnose or treat him, as one letter to the king reveals, My lord, the king, often asks me, why can't you determine the nature of my ailment and find a remedy? As I have previously conveyed to the king in person, his symptoms are unidentifiable. In the Assyrian worldview, illness was perceived as divine retribution. A sick king was seen as one who had lost the god's favor. Thus, Isar Haddon's deteriorating health was a matter of state security, to be concealed from the public at any cost. This secrecy was maintained through an ancient Assyrian royal protocol. Anyone who approached the king had to do so on their knees and veiled, ensuring that the king's frailty remained hidden from prying eyes. Isar Haddon's rise to the Assyrian throne was fraught with challenges, and he was determined to ensure a smoother transition of power for his successors. Recognizing the vulnerabilities of his position, especially with his sons still being minors, he took proactive measures to secure their futures. The treaty with Ramatea, a vassal ruler of the Median kingdom Eurekazabarna, highlighted Isar Haddon's concerns. He feared opposition from various factions, including his own family members, potential descendants of former Assyrian kings, and even influential Assyrian chiefs or governors. The reference to descendants of former royalty possibly alluded to the fact that Isar Haddon's lineage to the throne was through his grandfather, Sargon II, who might have been a usurper. This raised the possibility that legitimate heirs of previous kings might still be alive, posing a threat to Isar Haddon's descendants. To preempt a potential succession crisis, Isar Haddon named his eldest son, sin nadin as crown prince in 674 BC. However, his premature death two years later forced Isar Haddon to rethink his strategy. He then designated two of his sons for leadership. Shamash Shemukin was chosen as the heir to Babylon, while a younger son, Ashurbanipal, was selected for Assyria. This dual appointment was unprecedented, as traditionally, the Assyrian king also ruled over Babylon. The decision to appoint Ashurbanipal, the younger son, as the heir to the more significant title of Assyria might have been influenced by the origins of their mothers. While Ashurbanipal's mother was likely Assyrian, Shamash Shemukin's mother might have been Babylonian. Isar Haddon probably believed that the Babylonians would prefer a king with Babylonian heritage, hence positioning Shamash Shemukin for that role. However, the exact nature of the relationship and hierarchy between the two brothers, as intended by Isar Haddon, remains ambiguous. Both princes were soon integrated into the political landscape, providing some respite to their ailing father. Isar Haddon's mother, Nakia, played a pivotal role in ensuring the continuity of her grandson's reign. She orchestrated oaths of allegiance to Ashurbanipal from potential adversaries, mirroring Isar Haddon's own efforts to solidify his son's positions. 
He secured succession treaties with multiple rulers and governors, emphasizing the importance of a stable transition. A lingering threat to this stability was the possibility that Isarhaddon's brothers, especially Artemilisu, were still alive and harboring ambitions for the throne. Some records suggest their presence as late as 673 BC. Isarhaddon's meticulous planning and strategies were driven by his desire to prevent the kind of bloodshed and chaos that marked the beginning of his own reign. Isarhaddon, determined to conquer Egypt, launched a more substantial campaign in 671 BC. His journey began with a favorable prophecy in Haran, where he was told he would successfully conquer the world. Bolstered by this divine assurance, his forces quickly achieved victory in their first encounter with the Egyptians. However, despite this initial success and the prophecy, Isarhaddon was plagued by superstitions and fears for his safety. He performed the substitute king ritual, an ancient Assyrian practice meant to divert any impending harm from the king to a substitute. This ritual required the king to go into hiding for a hundred days, during which a stand-in, ideally someone with mental deficiencies, would assume the king's duties and identity. At the end of the period, the substitute was killed, ensuring the real king's safety from any predicted harm. Esar hadn't performed this ritual multiple times, leaving him absent from his duties for almost a year. In his absence, his crown princes and trusted officials managed the empire. Despite these interruptions, the Assyrian army continued its campaign in Egypt, achieving significant victories, including the capture of Memphis, the Egyptian capital. While the pharaoh Taharkam managed to escape, his family and the royal court were taken as hostages to Assyria. Isarhaddon then established Assyrian governance over the conquered territories, placing loyal governors in charge. Isarhaddon's victory steel, erected to commemorate his conquest of Egypt, depicts him in a dominant pose, showcasing his power and the submission of the Egyptian royalty. The conquest also led to the relocation of many Egyptians to Assyria. In his victory steel's inscription, Isarhaddon proudly recounts his triumphs over Egypt, detailing the capture of Memphis, the taking of the pharaoh's family as hostages, and the establishment of Assyrian rule over the region. He emphasizes the divine favor and might of Assur, the chief god of the Assyrian pantheon, attributing his successes to the deity's guidance and protection. The steel served as a lasting testament to Isarhaddon's achievements and the might of the Assyrian empire. Isarhaddon's reign was marked by a series of conspiracies and revolts, reflecting the tumultuous nature of the Assyrian political landscape during his time. The prophecy from Haran, which declared Susi as the rightful king and denounced the lineage of Sennacherib, was a significant threat to Isarhaddon's rule. The fact that such a prophecy emerged from Haran, whose oracles had previously predicted Isarhaddon's victory in Egypt, lent it considerable credibility. The rapid support Susi garnered, including from high-ranking officials like Isarhaddon's chief eunuch Ashur Nasir, showcased the underlying tensions and dissatisfaction within the Assyrian Empire. Isarhaddon's paranoia, which had been a defining trait of his rule, proved to be an asset in this situation. His extensive network of informants allowed him to stay ahead of the conspiracy, gathering intelligence on the plotters' activities across the empire. Isarhaddon's decision to perform the substitute king ritual for the second time in a short span was a testament to the gravity of the threat he perceived. Once the ritual was completed, he acted swiftly and decisively, launching a brutal purge against the conspirators. This was the second major purge of his reign, and it had a profound impact on the Assyrian administrative structure. The absence of an official to select the name of the year in the aftermath of the purge was a rare occurrence in Assyrian history and highlighted the extent of the disruption. The aftermath of the conspiracy led to significant changes in the Assyrian court. Esar hadn't introduced new ranks to further restrict access to him, a move that reflected his heightened sense of insecurity and the need to ensure tighter control over his surroundings. In summary, the conspiracy centered around Susi and the prophecy from Haran was a significant challenge to Esar Haddon's rule. However, his proactive intelligence gathering, combined with decisive action, allowed him to quash the revolt and further consolidate his power. The episode also underscores the volatile nature of Assyrian politics during this period and the challenges faced by rulers in maintaining control over a vast and diverse empire. Isarhaddon's reign was marked by both military conquests and internal challenges. 
His deteriorating health and the constant threats to his rule, both from external enemies and internal conspiracies, made his reign one of the most tumultuous in Assyrian history. Despite these challenges, Isar hadn't managed to expand the empire, notably with the conquest of Egypt, and to put in place a succession plan that, at least initially, ensured a smooth transition of power after his death. His sudden death in 669 BC, while on his way to suppress a rebellion in Egypt, marked the end of an era. Isar Haddon's meticulous planning for the succession of his sons, Ashurbanipal and Shamash Shemukin, to the thrones of Assyria and Babylon respectively, ensured that the empire did not immediately descend into chaos upon his death. This was a significant achievement, given the political instability that had characterized much of his reign. Ashurbanipal would go on to become one of the most famous Assyrian kings, known for his vast library in Nineveh, which provided a wealth of knowledge about the ancient Near East. Shamash Shemukin would rule Babylon for several years before tensions with his brother led to a major civil war. In retrospect, Isarhaddon's reign can be seen as a pivotal moment in Assyrian history. He navigated through numerous challenges, from revolts and conspiracies to health issues, with a combination of military might, political acumen, and strategic planning. His efforts to ensure a peaceful succession, while successful in the short term, could not prevent the long-term challenges that the Assyrian Empire would face in the years to come. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the tumultuous reign of Isarhaddon, a pivotal figure in Assyrian history. We hope you've gained a deeper understanding of the challenges and triumphs of his era. Thank you for watching this episode of History Uncovered. If you found this video informative and engaging, please like and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating stories from the past. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications so that you never miss a new video. Until next time, keep uncovering the stories that make our history so rich and intriguing.